so I want to thank um, Dr. Thompson for inviting me to give this talk today. I'm delighted to be here with you to talk about campus climate. Um, and can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Um, so this is results of a study just done at the end of fall semester that I'll be talking about today. Um, perhaps some of you took the survey. Um, but before getting started, I wanted to acknowledge Emma Frederick, who is a current doctoral student in my lab working with me on this work, who she was instrumental in getting the work started and doing the project and, of course, analyzing the data um, that I'll be talking about today. So we worked together on the presentation, even though she can't be here today, to actually talk with you. Um, so I wanted to start by talking with you about what sparked my interest in this area of climate. And I arrived in Johnson City here at ETSU about 10 years ago in 2006. Boy, does time fly. <laughs> um, and I had heard from several people that this was considered little San Francisco. OK, I'm waiting for the reaction. <laughs> um, and so maybe you, maybe you think that. Um, but I was curious about that um, as a label. Um, and so that got me curious about what is the climate here in terms of acceptability um, toward LGBT individuals, diversity. Um, and then as well as Safe Zone Trainer, I get that question a lot. You know, what's it like on campus? Um, and, and sometimes that question comes from people who identify along the LGBT spectrum and want to know, is it safe to come out? And so all of that, plus, of course, I'm a social psychologist. I'm interested in the social environment and how individuals engage with their social environment and are affected by it. So all of that led me to this work on social climate. And today I'm going to talk about why we should care about campus climate, um, results of this recent study, and so kind of gauging what may our campus climate be right now. And then maybe some strategies for warming the climate. Um, and I would like to engage you all in discussion about that. So my goal is to save some time for discussion. Um, so before I delve into campus climate, I wanted to have a brief commentary about language. And this is something that I continually struggle with and have discussions about with peers and students. And that is, how do we talk about ourselves? How do we talk about sexual and gender minorities? This is a conversation currently going on uh, on listservs that I'm part of professionally. How do we define ourselves um, in terms of LGBT or this long acronym that is continually changing? Um, or is it gender and sexual diversity? Um, so I'm wanting to say that the talk today, I will use many different terms. Um, and so just bear with me that I'll use LGBT a lot. I'll use sexual and gender minority a lot. But my ultimate goal is to capture the spectrum in some way, even if my current work is not able to do that yet. So that is the ultimate goal. OK, so delving in. I really care about people's ultimate life experience. And are they experiencing optimal health, well-being? And if not, what is contributing to that detriment? in health and well-being. In terms of the LGBT community, sexual and gender minorities experience environmental stress. So we're all familiar with this idea. Hate crimes, employment discrimination, unfair treatment, heterosexist assumptions, in other words, people sort of living their lives, assuming that everyone's heterosexual, um, and then marriage equality bans, to be more specific. There's some research on that. So environmentally, there's stress going on at the structural level. And then that can trickle down into personal stress, of course, because you think you can imagine that um, this plays out in individual social interactions. So perceived discrimination and unfair treatment, self-stigma, which is that internalization of the public stigma that people experience um, so that they feel negatively about themselves 
And even if individuals don't experience discrimination firsthand, they may hear about it in the air, so to speak, hear about other people experiencing it, and then anticipate that it might happen to them in the future. And that all can lead to concealment of identity. And I'm not going to go into a ton of detail, but there's an entire literature on concealment of identity that basically says it's harmful. <laughs> Concealing one's identity, although it can protect you, can also be harmful because you might be constantly spending cognitive resources on, you know, should I come out? Do people know that I'm gay? You know, what's going to happen to me? So there's a lot of effort spent in that, um, in that cognitive space. So all of that can contribute to what's called minority stress. So that's a term that you'll hear me use a lot today, minority stress. And minority stress is not just for sexual and gender minorities, but a lot of different minorities, such as racial and ethnic minorities. So there's a lot of literature in that and talking about health outcomes. But essentially, what this is saying is that minority identity comes to be linked with negative health outcomes or less well-being because of minority stress. So that added stress in the environment. And some of you may have heard me talk about these two data points that really are what get me up in the morning studying this work. And they illustrate the minority stress experience. So the first data point is that in states that had passed um, amendments banning same-sex marriage, so this was prior to the Supreme Court decision, of course, keep that in mind. Um, so in the states that had those bans, in the year following the ban, the individuals in those states experienced LGB individuals experience 37% increase in mood disorders, 40% increase in alcohol use disorders, and 250% increase in generalized anxiety. So that's, those are huge increases. Second data point, LGB individuals living in spaces um, such as states or counties that have um, high structural stigma and negative attitudes toward gay people essentially are on average losing 12 years off of their life. So if you think of mortality being the ultimate health outcome, that is a big deal. So these two data points really drive my interest in this particular area, and it makes me want to know what is our experience like in this region. Ultimately, we talk about the outcomes as disparities, and you may have heard that term, but just to, just to say, it's basically a difference. The disparity is a difference between the majority and the minority. Okay, so you'll hear me use that term today too. So given these health disparities and the structural disparities, the Institute of Medicine in 2011, this was the first time that they spoke up and said, hey, we need to understand and reduce these disparities for LGBT individuals. That's also a big deal. So now funding agencies like the National Institutes of Health, now they're starting to put money toward this topic. So I think that another call needs to go out for campus climate um, and understanding the climate and the well-being of students, faculty, staff, administrators, and how we can improve the climate. Putting that idea in a little bit of perspective, about 25 years ago, the Carnegie Foundation basically said in order to create vital communities of learning on college campuses, that we must provide a climate where intellectual life is central, but if you scroll down, civility is powerfully affirmed, dignity of all is affirmed, equality is vigorous, vigorously pursued, 
and well-being of each member is sensitively supported. So 25 years ago, we have this grounding in the need to pay attention for climate. Also about that same time, the Association of American Colleges and Universities challenged higher education to affirm and enact a commitment to equality, fairness, and inclusion. And that second, data po that second point gets me and in order to provide this foundation, a primary mission of the academy must be to create a climate that cultivates and celebrates difference. Okay, so we have this foundation that we're supposed to be reaching for. So we have our knowledge that some groups are experiencing disparities. Is that playing out on college campus? So let's talk about climate. So I chose this graphic because I think this gets at what, what I feel that climate is getting at. Uh, and that is, if you walk into a room, you might automatically feel whether it's a welcoming room, a welcoming environment, whether it's chilly, whether it's accepting. And, and it's basically a temperature gauge, Gallup, the census from 2010, um, the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force data, and then county level election data. They made this huge data set so that they could calculate a climate index. And they use these four data points to do that. Approval of marriages for same-sex couples, approval of adoption rights for same-sex couples, Approval of laws that protect lesbians and gay men from employment discrimination and beliefs that homosexuality is a sin. So they had these four. Now, on the one hand, this is really great because it's national. We can figure out what climate is at a national level um, in terms of acceptance. But what do you see that may be the downside of these four data points? Just off, off the cuff. Any downside? Yeah, it must be yeah. That's pretty yeah exactly. So it's pretty limited in terms of identities that it includes. Um, so my sense is it may be um, kind of a crude or rough estimate, but we have a long way to go to know what a, a climate index would be nationally. But the cool thing is that they mapped the US. So they mapped the climate, and the climate ranged from 45 to 92. So you can think of this as a heat index. It's what it's intended. And the blue, meaning chili, kind of blue chili and pink or reddish um, on the warmer side. Tennessee, of course, is in the blue. So in fact, it is the lowest estimate. So it's the 45 to 50. Um, and so this gives me some kind of comparison, if you will, for the climate experience here on campus. So maybe we can think of climate in terms of this temperature. But there is definitely a, a wide range of experience across the US. So honing in on our little part of Tennessee, my lab and students and myself are interested in understanding the experience of those living in this region. Some of you have heard me talk before about climate, and the first time I started studying climate, Siri doesn't want me talking. She's talking back. Um, so the first time was in 2011, and I set out, and along with my students, to find out what is the climate, and is it related to outcomes for students? So this is how we gauged climate along a temperature. This is called a feeling thermometer, and it ranges from 0 to 100, with 0 being completely not accepting or cool, to 100 being completely warm and accepting. And so students were asked, how is ETSU doing in terms of lesbians, gays, and bisexuals? Um, and so we, just to note, we collapsed that, so it was for everybody. It was just one item. And we found somewhere between 60 and 65 was the average temperature. 
which, you know, isn't terrible, um, but certainly room for improvement. But we also found that the negative attitudes reported by heterosexual identified students predicted LGB student outcomes. So the more negative the attitudes were held by heterosexual students, the less out LGB students were, the more they actively concealed their identity, the more they anticipated discrimination and actually reported experiencing that. Furthermore, these uh, minority stress indicators were linked to distress and self-reported health among the LGB students. So where we were finding some of this initial evidence for the importance of climate, but why we did a new study is that there were several limitations that were pretty huge, I would say, that we needed to address. <coughs> The first was that we used psychology undergraduate students, so those on the SONA system, which is an online participant pool system. So we, we had just engaged students. We didn't have any faculty, staff, administrators in our sample. Um, we had a limited set of questions. So we said, what's climate for lesbians, gays, and bisexuals, as if that's the same for everybody? And then finally, we didn't include gender identity at all. So that was an issue. So we wanted to address that. Um, and then, of course, we wanted to look at more outcomes. So I think another noteworthy reason to do the study again is, of course, change. A lot has happened since 2011 in the, our world, um, but definitely in terms of LGB, LGBT, outness and acceptance, um, nationally speaking. And so I was really wanting to know, what is our experience now? So the, here, herein lies the new study, Campus Pride. And Pride stood for Perceptions Regarding Identity and Diversity in the Environment. We addressed some of the limitations of the prior study. We expanded the list of identities related to climate. Um, we also, just to note, we also asked about climate related to other groups. And so we're in the process of um, analyzing the data and want to figure that out too and present it about other groups as well. Um, and we also expanded outcomes. So we're able to ask, do you feel like you belong on campus? Belongingness is important to me as a researcher because belongingness is actually a fundamental need in people's lives. Just like other fundamental needs that we have, socially it's a fundamental need. And it's actually linked to a wide range of outcomes in people's lives. So that piece I'm really curious about. Um, feeling safe on campus, both physically and in terms of being oneself. Um, whether ETSU is an affirming environment for their identity, whether they intend to finish their degree, or if it's a staff or faculty, whether they intend to work here, continue to work here, GPA, and whether people feel like they're treated differently because of their identity. So all of these we were able to gauge um, through the survey. So just making a plug to thank you for everyone who took the survey. Um, we were grateful. To, we have 973 that took it in November, so that was a good number. I also want to thank those of you who were instrumental in creating the survey. So we had engaged um, women's studies. Thank you, Phyllis and Hillary. Um, we engaged Norma Honecker. Um, we talked with Mary Jordan from Equity and Diversity and other faculty staff representatives from, say, advising and um, student affairs. So we, we feel like we got a lot of input on what actually we need to know on campus. So now for the exciting part. Um, I thought I would give you some data on demographics so you know exactly who took the survey. Um, looking at gender identity, the majority um, identified as um, female, 
but you see quite a range of identities. So we have about 5% genderqueer, about 5% transgender, um, 2.5 identified as intersex, um, and people could put more than one, so I'm not adding the totals here, because people can put more than one of those. In terms of sexual orientation, 72% uh, identified as heterosexual, so just under 30% non-heterosexually identified. And we got quite a bit of variation there in terms of individual identities. By far, most people were on the main campus, but we did have some representation from Quillen and Kingsport. The analyses that I'm talking about kind of have everybody together, but I would like at some point to pull out just the main campus um, to see what if there's any differences there. 42% of those who took the survey were undergrads, um, but you see some variation. We have five, about 5% 5 administrators, 10% uh, tenure track faculty, we have some non tenure track faculty, grad students, and staff. I also was curious, just really quickly, in terms of ETSU position by sexual orientation. So, <clears throat> for example, across the board here, we see that um, straight women and straight men were the most represented in the groups, which makes sense given our numbers. Um, but in terms of gay men, 5% were in the undergrads, 4% faculty, um, actually 7% faculty. Lesbians, it looks like faculty is driving that identity representation. 10% um, grad students were in the bisexual. So um, you get a sense of how that breakdown is. Um, in terms of race ethnicity, we have 80% white, 6% um, black or African American, um, and some other variation in terms of Hispanic, Asian, Native American, and Pacific Islander. Um, I want to note that I went on ETSU's website to see the ethnic breakdown, and it's fairly comparable to this. So I was excited to see that. What's that? No, I was saying, I'm amazed that the numbers are so close. Yeah, I thought so too. Can I ask, can you go back a couple sure seconds? Sure thing. The, the other, on an administrator, on their other, such a Oh, process. yeah. What is that? I'm really glad you mentioned that. So other is um, someone who didn't want to report their identity, or they could have put some other identification. We're in the process of going through the others to see if they should be in other categories or if um, just what they are. So that's a work in progress right now because th those are pretty high numbers yeah. in some of the groups. So we're more soon on that. I also wanted to know how people's sexual orientations converged with ethnic identity. Um, and so this is the percent uh, in each ethnic group that self-identified as heterosexual. So we can get the, if you subtract from 100, what the percent would be of non-heterosexual, so the other sexual minority groups. So um, for instance, whites, 77% were um, straight identified or heterosexual individuals, whereas the African American group, um, about almost 40% of those were identified as sexual minority. So I thought that was an interesting find. All right, so the crux of the data here, what is climate like? So we asked this question, the thermometer question, for a variety of identities, and this is what we found. This left box is overall, everybody in the sample, and then the right box is what those climates are for those actually identified as those individual categories. So for instance, um, the climate for gay men, according to the 973, is 59. But for gay identified people, 49. So on that, just a question for clarification. Uh, yeah. On the left, people who identify as heterosexual? 
their opinions of what yes. it might be like. Yes, right. And then the only right is, you know, kind of, mm -hmm. that, that doesn't make sense anymore. Yeah. So um, with the exception of lesbian identified and transgender individuals, those who self-identify, they identify the climate as being chillier um, than the total group. Okay. Um, I also want to just note the numbers in terms of climate overall, if you think of these as temperatures. So for transgender in the 40s, I wear my winter coat, um, whereas some of the other numbers are a little bit warmer. Um, so just, just noting that, that we're seeing some differences by individual grouping. <coughs> So now getting to some of these ETSU outcomes, like is the environment safe? So what I did, just because we had some really small numbers, if we try to look at some subgroups with by gender as well. Um, so these are any sexual minority and then heterosexual identified people, and we're looking at comparisons. So across the board, heterosexual identified people on campus feel safer physically um, about being open about their true selves and that they can find places to feel safe. So there's a significant difference between the two groups of people. Same pattern for whether ETSU is an affirming environment for their identity. So for sexual orientation or gender identity, those heterosexually identified feel it's more affirming. I did this kind of same breakdown for gender minority and gender majority. So the gender minorities are those who were either transgender or genderqueer. Across the board, the safety is higher for those of the gender majority than the minorities. And same for affirming. So gender minorities think of ETSU as less affirming for their identities. Um, so we wanted to give you a picture of some actual reports of experience as well. So if you look across the top in the green, um, these items are, have you ever been treated differently by students, by faculty or staff, verbally harassed, physically threatened, or physically attacked? So a note about these numbers. We first wanted to average them. So what's the average score? Because people could answer not at all, all the way up to I experienced this a lot. And so the numbers in terms of the average are very small, somewhere between one and three. Whereas if it was experienced a lot, you'd be a five. So I want to make note of that. But the means weren't really capturing the data. So we thought, you know, any experience of this is unacceptable. So who cares about an average? Are people experiencing this at all on campus versus not? So these are percentages that actually experienced within the categories. So I would say look for the big numbers and scroll across. So it looks like by far trans individuals are reporting the, the most in terms of frequency that they've experienced it. Um, and then by men, I would say those numbers are fairly high as well, but within different groups you have fairly high numbers. So I think this is an important data point where we do have this going on. So it may not be often or a lot, but important to pay attention to given it's happening at all. Dr. Williams, one question while that's hot still up, because it's so interesting and such good information. The first two categories, can you say that the, that perception plays into that? Obviously verbal and physical being threatened, attacked, and harassed are real things. But the perception of those first two categories, and as you move across, Especially as you see those numbers drop quite a bit, that there there weren't as many that were physically attacked, but look at how mm. they felt about how they were treated. Excellent point. Um, so I think that's a really good point. That 
especially with treated differently, that's, that's a perception of being treated differently. Just as perceived climate is a perception. Um, so, I think it's hard to say exactly, I mean, that's, that's really the limitation of studying stigma or studying discrimination, because it's all about whether someone feels like that happened to them. Um, and so we don't want to invalidate that, because there's something palpable about the environment that is contributing to that. So I'm more interested in understanding what was that experience like. Obviously, we've got the numbers that show on the right that um, the incidences aren't there. So, so you can be treated differently yeah. and not be physically attacked. So, yeah. And great point. Probably stronger than just perception. And I think a lot of this can be subtle. I mean, there's subtle racism, there's subtle heterosexism. It's not all blatant or unfair, like actual discrimination in terms of losing a job, for example. But it can be just being treated differently. I feel it's because they're straight, I think is the question. I mean, yeah, people feel discrimination on so many intersectional levels. Yeah. But is it because of their straightness? Like, I don't know how you would ask that question. I remember taking this, but I don't remember how that, anyway, it's just an interesting thing. Yeah. We need more information, I agree. But it's really, I think, an interesting data point to start with. Um, so going back to the idea of minority stress, so those indicators of that stress that we talked about earlier. Again, comparing sexual minorities and heterosexuals across the board, sexual minorities are reporting more perceived stigma, anticipating stigma, concealment of identity, and psychological distress. Same with gender minorities compared to majority. So same pattern of results. ETSU outcomes, so we also asked about GPA, and are you going to stay here? Um, for sexual minorities, there was a significant difference in GPA compared to heterosexual students. So heterosexual students had on average a GPA of 3.54 and sexual minorities 3.4. There were no differences between the groups in these other outcomes. For gender minorities, there also was a lower GPA than gender majority individuals, and they reported being less likely to complete their degree here. So here's that, yes? Is that a self-reported GPA? Self-reported, okay. yeah. Yeah, because we don't know who these right. people are. That was really important for me not to know that, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, so belongingness, getting back to that need to belong that I care a lot about. Um, so comparing sexual minorities to heterosexual individuals, um, heterosexuals report more belongingness, um, and sexual minorities report less belongingness and wishing that they were more connected. And gender minorities report less belongingness um, but no difference in whether they wish they were more connected. So ultimately, does this climate variable that we're studying um, predict or is it related to important outcomes? So what we found was that the warmer you reported the climate to be, the more you perceived you belonged, the more safe you felt, the more affirming you thought the environment was, and the less distressed you were. So this climate, that one item climate, is predicting these outcomes. There is a little bit of variation. So if we start to look within groups, um, there is a little bit of variation. Um, in exactly which of those variable outcomes climate relates to. Um, and it appears that across the board for trans, it's pretty much related to everything. And then finally, belongingness. Again, I kind of go back to that because it's so predictive of everything. Is it predictive of outcomes here? 
and belongingness was correlated with better GPA, likelihood to remain at ETSU, um, or working here if you were staff or faculty. And then it was related to safety, perceiving the atmosphere as affirming, and less distress. So it seems like this belongingness variable might be something that I want to explore further. So in sum, um, we found a variety of perceptions of climate, so that temperature gauge on campus, depending on which identity we were talking about and whether you self-identified as that group. So there's some disparity or discrepancy there. And we found climate linked to these important ETSU outcomes. We have much more exploring to do with the data. We want to look at other identities. We want to look at intersections of identity um, to the extent that we can if we have enough people, say, in ethnic minority within gender or sexual minority, to look at those experiences, too. Um, but I think this is a start. And ultimately, my mind now goes to what's the next step research-wise, but also what do we do on campus to continually improve our climate? And this is where I'd like to engage you in conversation. I have my own ideas, but who knows if they're good. Um, so I'd love to hear what you have to say. And if you have any questions, make sure we have enough time. We do. <laughs> um. So, uh, yeah, I really love this. Um, I think that it goes as a given. But uh, one of the research projects that I am starting and have just started is looking at this through a, a resource and student service and access lens um, to talk about what some other universities have done and offer their students and how that has contributed to high impact practice. And, what is happening on this campus specifically and what our students um, feel about that specifically, mm -hmm. um, and then what our students would like to see moving forward in the future. Um, so, hopefully, Yay. I'll be able to um, provide some, some really uh, tangible answers. So you are, just to be clear, you're looking at other universities and kind of benchmarking what they do and see what we can bring here. Yeah. Awesome. Well, any way I can be helpful, I'd yeah. love to be. Yeah. But I think Heroes is a really great start. Like having I do, too. Yeah. Save some. I, think, I think those two things yeah. um, are really great. I, I'm glad you mentioned that, because we have Heroes, and we have Women's Studies, and we have Safe Zone, the Counseling Center, and they ha just started a transgender support group this this semester, we have the Multicultural Center. So we, I mean, I feel like we're building um, and, and improving and, but yeah, I'm glad that we're in a direction of improvement. What else? I Phyllis. I thought about, uh, Susan's question, um, of the, the slide, it was the slide that um, experiencing campus because of, of identity and perceived discrimination. Uh huh. Is, have you done any work to connect perceived discrimination or perceptions to health disparities? I mean, so has that been connected to the group that have, have these perceptions of discrimination have also indicated or identified these particular health disparities or negative outcomes for health? So we have made some linkages so far. We've found that different groups um, have better health and different groups experience less discrimination. But I think maybe what you're asking is, does that difference in, ex in discrimination explain the difference in health? And we haven't done that yet. And I think that would be a next step to see if it actually explains it. I mean, we certainly found links that are important. Um, but I would be I would be curious to do that as the next step. Yeah. Overall, I've never understood um, when we talk about discrimination and we, when we label uh, sexual gender or sexual minorities. 
why do we keep using the word sexual? Mm. Because a lot of a lot of people, when they hear gay, lesbian, yeah. transgender, their mind goes right away to the sexual actions. I know. And so I guess all of us could be a sexual minority. I mean, you don't know what position I like. And maybe I fit with somebody else that takes that same position. And maybe it's... I know. It really is problematic how we so, label. So changing that terminology, and not just here on campus, yeah. but across the globe, across yeah. the world, why do we always use sexual when we're, when we're trying to describe um, a certain population? Oh, that is such, know, it's such, no, it's that. such a big question. I agree with you. Because I've never understood yeah. why that terminology is used, especially when it's used for discriminating. Yeah, and and sexual life is such just one component of a multifaceted human being, and so why do we focus the label on that? Because that's the difference, and we label the difference. The thing that's different, we label. Um, and so I think that's a piece of it, and then that label of difference kind of explodes into being treated differently. Um, yeah. Yeah, and so this list of Raman, we've been debating on the labeling, and some people said we should say sexual and gender diversity, and or diverse sexual and gender characteristics, and then people are, but but it, that could be fetishes, or it could be you know it could be whatever it is. Um, what is pansexual? I don't know what that term means. My understanding of pansexual. Yeah. Um, my understanding is you don't discriminate on who you're attracted to. Um, so if anyone has a different definition, chime in. But that's my understanding. It's not limited to male or female or lesbian or gay. I was just going to say, I, I teach a course for counseling and human services called Understanding Cultural Diversity. And that is a conversation that we have in the class is not categorizing somebody specifically by their sexual behavior. And one of the, the terms that I have heard and encouraged my students to use is affection and orientation. Um, when we're talking about affection and orientation. And they're, and they're required to use that terminology in the course. And I know some individual people um, who affection, affectionately orient themselves toward women, but sexually orient themselves toward men. So I mean, I think that becomes really complex. And um, I wanted to give a plug to Sherry, also working in my lab. Um, she is interested in the attraction versus the behavior and how, how we might define ourselves or not define ourselves. And maybe you would do a better job explaining it. Um, there are nuances in research to look at um, that specifically look at sexual behavior, sexual um, attraction, um, affectional um, attraction, and stuff like that. Mostly what we do is um, about um, perceptions of the environment and how you're treated and self-identity. So mm -hmm. um, I, would, I would say that the reason we still say sexual is because that's the common language that um, people know of how to refer to themselves as. And, um, and while our options on our surveys might still be limited um, for, um, and you know, maybe not include everything that, that exists, but um, we do try to include what people identify as. And I think that's the important part I think that's a good point to remember the identity piece. People can also gain a lot of empowerment through identity, identity and common identity. So I think that that can be an issue. There's also a thing called, in, uh, it's a, I think it's a book, it's called Inventing Heterosexuality. Um, and it gives a good uh, background and history on how the the words heterosexuality and homosexuality sort of came into being and how they were constructed and what they originally meant and what they now mean. Um, and so I would encourage you to potentially look at that because um, it actually uh, is, is very, very interesting and very modern language. Um, so, yeah.
uh, inventing uh, heterosexuality or inventing homosexuality. All of that. Okay. Thanks for mentioning that. So, any other thoughts in terms of climate suggestions, discussion points? Yeah. So identified um, in, within other groups. So working together to create um, an overall change might be um, an interesting question, honestly. I, I have been so focused on sexual and gender minority issues that I was like, wow, that seems like a new idea. I think that's a really great point, and um, in terms of college campuses, no change can happen without involving a whole campus. Uh, and so working towards celebration of difference in general might be a strategy um, that incorporates a lot of identities where people aren't feeling like one group is going to be singled out. Um, or, but building ways to have discourse or to have interaction between different groups of people. and. Um, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding and misperception and we know from social psychology that having personal interactions with groups different than yourself um, is really the only way that in education to make change. Dr. Williams, did you um, ask about um, religious Yes, religion? I did. Have you been able to analyze that data? Um, we haven't looked specifically about climate yet related to that, but I will say that um, a large part, I want to say 60 or 70 percent identified as um, some form of Christian, with the bulk of that being um, Protestant, Baptist. Uh, and then I would say about 400 of the 450 um, let me think 400 of the 450 heterosexually identified were Baptist. So I would say a large part of the um, so that's kind of what we're looking at demographically so far. But we haven't looked at how climate differs or how experience differs yet. Because, you know, I, I mean, and I, I'm just making assumptions, but, you know, it's sort of, I guess, the elephant in the room, bring the Bible bill, and how is that going to reconcile with warming our climate? Yeah. Or, or is that even a part of it? I, I mean, I think. ETSU certainly isn't an island. I mean, we, we are surrounded by the larger community, and even within our community, like you mentioned, um, the, the strong um, religious piece, I think that historically has um, explained some negative attitudes um, and caused tension, the, the tension between that. Um, and the, the slide I showed early on with the map of the U.S. and Tennessee being 45 to 50 in terms of their estimate of climate compared to other states, I think, you know, that's very telling. So I, I agree. We're in a location that makes it challenging. Um, and perhaps that's why some people call it Little San Francisco because there is some um, acceptability or pockets of acceptance anyway compared to the larger community. So we're doing some climate work in the larger community, and so far estimates are in the 30s for climate. So definitely sensing a difference. Um, 
I think that's key. I think most universities who succeed at any initiatives that work with the community that they're mm -hmm. in really effectively. Mm -hmm. I think that's key. Yeah. Anything else? Well, I would love to talk with you individually if you have anything you want to talk about or questions, um, ideas. So thanks so much for being here today. Appreciate it. Thank you.